beautiful thing, uh, one of the beautiful things that we can gather here is that we can actually make some noise. <laughs> Why not we let the people on the internet know that we are excited and we miss them as well? Come on, let's give them some love, shall we? <laughs> Amen. What a time to be alive. And I believe that God has a purpose for us in this season and He wants us to accomplish that. So no, no matter where you are, whether you are joining us physically or you are joining us online, I believe that today, right now, is a time where God will speak to us and move in our midst. Shall we just lift our holy hands wherever we are just to pray and just commit this time to God and also pray for one another, pray for the world out there. Let's also pray for our friends on the internet that's watching. Let's lift our praise. Let's lift our worship and adoration. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Oh, Shakaniya, Nakabaya, Nikidiya, Jesus, we pray, Lord, for your presence to fill this place, God. Oh, bless this time as we gather in your name. Move among us, Lord. Speak to us, touch us. Lord, even for people on the internet, Lord, we pray for their internet. We pray for the connection, Father. Above all, Lord, we pray that God, you will touch us wherever we are. We love you, we love you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Lord. Oh, come and fear us, Lord. Come and fear us, Lord. Jesus, God, we pray this morning, God, we commit our hearts to you. And this gathering of your people, we ask, let your kingdom come. Your will be done in this place on earth as it is in heaven. So today, everyone Lord, that's watching will have an encounter with you. Everyone that's here, God, will be deeply touched and strengthened. We thank you, Jesus. We ought to give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. Amen.
sun now bursting through the clouds Black and white turns to color all around All is new in the Savior I am found See the sun us here enjoy praising Jesus. Woo! Woo! So church, today we're going to sing a new song. This song is called Even When the Fight Calls. So I just want to share a little bit of why we chose this song and a little bit of the backstory of this song. So in May during MCO, I was retrenched by my company and all of a sudden like, I lost all my source of income. And I felt like my world has lost stability. And I asked God, why is this happening to me? Why during this time? And I believe that we all have days like this, days where we don't want to go back and live it. But during this time, Gabriel shared a verse with me. So in John chapter 16, verse 33, it says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Amen? Amen. So church, when we follow Jesus, it doesn't mean that we won't face any storms. It doesn't mean that we won't face any trials. But what I learned is that we can anchor ourselves in the truth that Jesus will never forsake us, and He has overcome. And you know what? Praise God. Because after two weeks, I found a new job. Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! So as we sing this song, as we sing this new song, I pray that if you are going through a season of trials, if you are going through a season of challenges, of storms, let the words minister to you. Let the words bring you courage. Let the words encourage you.
declare your kingdom over this place, over our hearts right now. Because in your kingdom, God, there is your authority where God, you empower and you have authorized us, God, to live for you. That we can be sent out, God, to represent you and your kingdom, to be your ambassadors. So today, God, instead of praying, God, troubles will leave us, but we pray you'll give us strength and miracles, God. We pray that, God, you will empower your children in such a time to shine for you, to be a blessing wherever we go, Lord. And today, God, let your truth be spoken to us. Let tr the truth of God set us free so that we can be truly free. Thank you, Jesus. You love your church, God. Build us to be a glorious house of God. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone say... And everyone say, Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus praise. Give Him glory. Give Him honor. He is worthy. Jesus. We serve a living God. Amen. It's so beautiful to see everyone. And you know what? Whenever we lift up His praise, the Bible says that He's enthroned in our midst. And today I believe that God is going to do something not just for us, but it is for His glory. It is for His purpose. And a lot of times we do not understand, but you know, the Bible says that if we just love Him, all things will work together. All things will work together. So all we need to do in this season, just keep loving Jesus. Just keep our eyes on Him. Just learn how to dwell in His presence. Church, can we just learn how to pray more and just read His Word? I'm believing that He's going to not just sustain us, but He's going to use us to be a blessing wherever we go. The world out there needs to hear the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen. Why not you just tell your neighbor, walk around a bit, you know, you know, give them a, a something like that, alright? So say, just keep loving Jesus. Let's do that right now. Good morning, church. So good to see all of you. You may take your seat right now. Amen. What a blessing to hear um, the testimony that Danny shared with us just now. Really praise God to be able to see his dependency on God. Amen. I'm so inspired by Danny. Where's Danny? Somewhere around. Yeah. Ah, oh, there you go, Danny. Amen. All right. Um, we're coming to a time of our offering, you know, and this time of offering is really an opportunity for all of us to partner with God. And as we bring our offering to the Lord this morning, may we give out of the place of generosity. I just want to share something from the book of Matthew, all right, chapter 19, and it's about the rich young ruler, all right, the rich young ruler. And the lesson that we can learn from this rich young ruler is this is that money cannot buy submission. You see, Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. You notice the sequence of this event. You know, Jesus said, go sell everything and then follow me. The act itself of giving wasn't what Jesus was looking for. He was looking for the act of submission. And submission is really something that money cannot buy. Regardless of how much you put into the offering today, what we need to know is we need to have a heart of submission to God first. Are we willing to submit ourselves to God more than just putting some token or for the sake of charity? More importantly, God is looking for our hearts here today. Let's just what Jesus said. Jesus said, follow me, come, follow me, and you have treasure in heaven. So the rich young ruler started the whole part by asking Jesus, what can I do to inherit eternal life? But you see, the rich young ruler had great possession and he couldn't part away from that. He won eternal life but he don't want to part away from the great possession. So Jesus is really looking for submission more than our possessions today. It's more than the act of giving, you know, but Jesus is looking into our hearts today. So if you have something to eat every day, 
you have something to give to God every day. Amen. This was something that I was very inspired to hear. Someone shared, if you have something to eat every day, we have something to give to God every day. Today, more than our offering, let us give our hearts to God. Amen. Let us come with a heart of submission and to pray and surrender this offering to God's hand. Whether you're giving your tithes or your offering, even for those who are watching online, um, you can do it through the QR pay here, or you can also do it physically uh, by putting um, your money into this envelope. Amen. Let us pray for our offering. Jesus, we thank you for this morning, uh, amazing time of dwelling in your presence, to be able to be here to worship you. Father, we do not take this for granted as your people. And God, even as we come before you in this time of offering, Lord, we know more than our possessions, you are looking for our submission to you. And I ask, oh, Father, that each and every one of us here, as we give our offering to you, Lord, would you do a deeper work in us to submit our hearts to you as well, to submit to living for your glory, for your purposes. So we pray and surrender this offering to your hands. May you use it for the extension of your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ian. Everyone doing good so far? This week we have 120 in this room. If you look around you, take a second to do that. This is not what church used to be like. But now every one of us have to wear masks. Um, and it's really not easy to be able to do this behind a mask because you can't see my face, actually. But you can't see me. And I can't see you because you all look to me like you're serious. But I know behind that you're smiling, right? Yeah. Amen. Um, I really pray that today's uh, message will be a blessing to all of us. Uh, and I'll be preaching from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So if you have a Bible with you, would you open to that? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Before we go into the Word, I wanted to offer us some context into what we are talking about today, what we're going to be learning from the Word of God today. I want to ask you this question. You know, every year in a dictionary, there is a word of the year, right? Sometimes it's a new word that people have been using for a long time and it becomes a word of the year. Now, what do you think is the word for this year? The most word that you've heard so much so far in the past seven months. Any idea? Pandemic? Yep. Anything else? Sorry? COVID is probably one of them. I think one of the biggest words is unprecedented. You've heard that everywhere. In sermons, you read it online, the videos that you watch uses the word unprecedented. And very rarely these words have been used, but this year is used like unprecedented a lot of times. Another word was pandemic. You know, COVID-19, suddenly this word, whenever we hear this word now, we are shaken. Because of this word, we are seated here like that, no longer being able to be with one another in a closer setting. Maybe another word for you is called Zoom. You know, all of us have been to Zoom meetings so far. Yeah? All, everyone here. You see, before this, when you think about the word Zoom, Zoom used to be like, okay, let's go fast. We're Zooming towards there. You know, or you're drawing Mazda. I think Mazda has a technology called Zoom. But right now, Zoom is an app. Like, hey, I'm meeting at Zoom later at 12 p.m. for prayer, okay? That becomes a new word. But I think there's one more bigger word that has been taking the world by storm lately. And it's the word called cancelled. Cancelled. We're going to be talking a little bit more about cancel culture today and what is the root of all of this. You see, over the past few months, we've experienced so many, again, unprecedented events. Okay? And for some of us here, uh, our faith has grown stronger during this time. Praise God. You know, during this season of lockdown, we have been able to see faith beyond crisis. But for some of us here, during this season of lockdown, we've also put our faith to a pause mode. And now that everything is getting back to normal, work, church, life group, family, things are back to normal again, we are putting it back to resume. For some of us, we've gone through a really challenging time, like what Danny shared with us just now. You know, it's a season where we've lost probably job, income, opportunities. It affects us financially or physically as well. And for some of us, maybe we have been so impacted by world events that has happened lately. All right? Um, in the United States, one of the biggest events that have happened is the death of a black man named George Floyd, and that has affected the whole world, basically. And people have been more begun to be more proactive in racism, fighting against racism and injustice. But for all of us, and give me a second, 
Okay, I'm looking for my pointer. I think it's somewhere here. There you go. For some of us, this is the questions that we'll ask. Is, are we in the last days? You see all the things that are happening around you and you ask, are we in the last days? There's sickness happening. There's so much injustice going on. Are we in the last days? But the real and deeper question is this. Are we ready spiritually for the return of Jesus? We're going to be talking a bit about the return of Jesus and what that looks like. Because I believe it's so important for us as believers to know, are we ready spiritually when Jesus returns? And we're going to look into 2 Thessalonians today. You see, we cannot be exact. I'm not here telling you that there's an exact time, exact hour that Jesus returned. Because the Bible did not give us an exact hour. In fact, Jesus said you will not know the hour. But there are certain things that we can see you know, that would take place before the return of Jesus. And one of them is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, all right? So we're going to be looking into this figure called the man of lawlessness. The man of lawlessness. And then we'll see what Paul is asking us to do in response to this man of lawlessness. Amen? Well, my sermon title today is Standing Firm in Lawlessness. Let us pray for the word this morning. Father, we thank you for your word from 2 Thessalonians 2 this morning. It has to be into your word, O oh Father Lord. God, we pray that you will illumine our minds and heart. Let your word come alive. Let it be beyond the words of man, but we pray your truth will be unveiled in this place and will set our hearts free as well. So Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. Even as you read through this challenging events that has taken place in the word of God and how it relates to the world today, Lord, we are thankful that we have Christ on our side. So we honour you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Before we go into that, I just want to give us some background. Is that okay? So that we know what are we talking about. You see, Second Thessalonians 2 is written after a book called First Thessalonians. Amen. <laughs> Very easy. It's not a Bible quiz. All right. Uh, but there are two letters that Paul wrote uh, to the church um, of, in Thessalonica. And this is the second letter. And the second letter is very focused about the second coming of Jesus. How many of you thought that during this time, Jesus would come back already? Okay, I was one of them who thought, okay, Jesus is coming back already. With all that is going on around the world, with what is happening in the church, I think Jesus is coming back already. Uh, but Paul has a heart that really loves the Thessalonians because whenever Paul travels to different parts, right, he will always boast of the Thessalonians to other churches in different parts of the world. Um, and he'll always tell of the Thessalonians' faith and how they have so much love for each other, especially during persecution, because they went through a tough time of persecution. Now, do you think we're going through a time of persecution? Probably yes, to a certain extent. But I can assure you that more will come in the last days. You know? And in 2 Thessalonians, Paul is addressing one of the problems that the church was facing at that point of time, because they were so afraid of all the persecution that's taken place, they thought that Jesus already came back. But Paul here is reminding them, no, 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 he's not back yet because before he comes back, there will be this one figure called the man of lawlessness, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And probably you've heard of this word called the Antichrist. Yeah. Okay? The man of lawlessness is the Antichrist. But the good news is this, Paul didn't just end it there, but Paul continued and said, but when Jesus returns, he would defeat this man of lawlessness, he'll bring justice to us as Christians, and he'll bring... Um, uh, kind of judgment to those who do not believe in him. So let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. Starting from verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarm, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. See, the day of the Lord has come. Just to offer you some context about the day of the Lord, because if we think about the day of the Lord, we think it's today, Sunday, Monday. The day of the Lord doesn't just happen in one day. It happens across thousands of years. Uh, there are a lot of things that will happen in the day of the Lord when you study the Bible. There will be a seven-year tribulation, okay, according to the book of Daniel, there will be a seven-year tribulation. There will be a 1,000-year of reign of Christ in the world. Then Jesus will come back, defeat Satan for the final time, and then there'll be a great white throne judgment, all right? So the day of the Lord that is talking here, it doesn't just happen in one day. It happens uh, across an extended time. Now let's look at verse 3. So Paul said this, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, okay? 
unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So two things that must happen before. Firstly is there will be rebellion. Okay, we'll talk more about that. What is rebellion? And then there will be man of lawlessness. Oh, thanks. I forgot to click on that. <laughs> there will be a man of lawlessness who will be revealed. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. Okay. Verse 7, I want you to look at this. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. All right? So the man of lawlessness is not here yet, but the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, Paul said. Um, and he go on to say this, Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Verse 9, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception, for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be safe. They refuse to love the truth and so be safe. And finally, verse 11, Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This is a really heavy topic to talk about, but it's so necessary because we are living in an age of lawlessness. The things that you see around you, just think about what has happened in the world in the past six months alone. We can see that lawlessness is rising. There are more murder. There is more political problems that are happening. Yeah. There are lawlessness when it comes to race, when it comes to system, when it comes to human rights. But what does the Bible say about lawlessness? Let's look at this. The word lawlessness in the Bible, when you read the Bible, sometimes it comes out as unrighteousness or sometimes it comes out as inequity. All right? Those two words are very closely linked to the word lawlessness. And according to the Bible, the root of lawlessness is rebellion. It means there is lawlessness because we rebel against God. All right? Am I the only sinner here? I hope I'm not. All of us are sinners here. Yeah. Right? We rebel against God. That's why it's lawlessness. But God came and sent His Son for us so that He gives us His righteousness. That is the good news of the gospel. So if we are to be lawless, it means we don't follow the law. We go against them, all right? And according to 1 Timothy 1.9, laws are necessary. You see, 1 Timothy 1.9 says this, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers. You see, laws are important in this world. If there is no law, there is no standard of justice. Right? So anyone can do anything they want and they can get away with it. But there are certain laws in place that make sure that there's a standard that people have to meet. If they don't follow, they are lawless. All right? And they will be fine. Okay? Similarly for us as well, during this MCO uh, season, you know, some of us can go out. Um, and I've seen recently someone was having dinner and supper somewhere. So many people on a table when they're not supposed to do that, going against the law. So what happened? The police came. You see? And the police fine everyone 1,000 ringgit. Hey, that is a lot. That can feed your supper for the entire year. 1,000 ringgit, everyone, just because they were sitting too closely together. You see, what determines that? It is the law. Right? If there's no law, they can do anything that they want. And we're here, you see, wearing masks, we're sitting like that because we are observing the law as well. Right? And as Christians, we are to be law-abiding. Amen? We're supposed to follow the law. Right? And First John 3, 4 goes on to say more about lawlessness because Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. In fact, sin is lawlessness. This is what 1 John 3, 4 says. Sin is lawlessness. You see, when we commit a sin, we are lawless. And as sinners, we break God's law. Like what I said, I'm a sinner. We are all sinners. We break God's law. But because of Christ, we have received the righteousness from Him. So lawlessness is a rejection of God. Right? When we are lawless, we are rejecting God. And we can see here in 2 Thessalonians, all right, verse 9, we can see how there is, um, the coming of the Lord's one is by the activity of Satan. So you see, Satan is the one that's empowering 
this particular man of lawlessness to be lawless, right? Other passages about lawlessness is here. Matthew 24, verse 12, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. 2 Peter 3, 17, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care of what you are not, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Matthew 7, 23, a very sobering one. And then I, Jesus, will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You see, lawlessness is so often emphasized in the Bible, especially related to the last days. Okay? We are not in the day of the Lord yet, but it's so important for us to know this because the Bible says that as the day approaches, there will be more lawlessness. There will be an increase of lawlessness in our generation. Yeah. And to a point when the man of lawlessness appear, he'll be welcomed with open arms. Today, we're going to be talking about this word called cancel culture. Cancel culture. How many of you have heard of this word before? Just a show of hands. Ooh, okay, surprising. We have about 30%. 30% who have heard the word called cancel culture. It's a thing that actually has been happening for some time, but this year it has been elevated to a new level. All right? And this is really one of the mystery of lawlessness according to uh, what Paul is saying here. This is one of the prevailing mysteries of lawlessness that's happening. You see, we are living right now in an age where there are so many cultural wars that are happening. The wars are not just between, you know, the US and China, US and Russia. It's no longer just a war that's physical, but it's also a cultural war, a cultural battle, a cultural uh, ideology battle that's happening as well. And in the past, all right, if you don't have this, if I have something that I disagree with you, I can come to you, I can debate with you with sound argumentation, okay, we'll listen to one another and say, okay, you know what, maybe you have a point. But because of this thing that has happened lately, once I said something that is in disagreement with you, you can cancel me directly and say, nope, I don't believe in you, you're not on my side. And this has happened um, increasingly more and more these days. How does this look like? Okay, so if I'm a musician, all right, and I said something that you don't agree with, you can decide to boycott my music. All right? If I am an athlete, okay, means I'm a football player, which I hope to be one day, you can decide to burn my jersey. And that's not a very nice thing to do when you're a football player. You see, the message of cancer culture is this. We won't engage with your ideas. We will engage you and shame you out of existence. You will be cancelled. This is the message of cancer culture. Now, I want you to think about this and think about the gospel. Is this the gospel? It is, in fact, the contrary of the gospel. So how do we bring the gospel to a culture that is already like this right now? Because right now in the cancer culture is that if you've done something that is wrong in the past and people found it online, you are cancelled. People have lost their job because of that. Because of something they said eight years ago, today they lose their job because people are saying, hey, eight years ago you were racist. Eight years ago you said things that were very demeaning to a particular sex. Now you're fired. People are losing their job because of that. And many people will not want to have anything to do with you anymore. They, want, they don't want to associate themselves with you. If you think about this, the world has been fighting for inclusion, diversity, but now with all that is happening, you will see that all that they've been fighting for for so many years is really nothing. Because now they're starting to cancel one another. How many of you know J.K. Rowling? J.K. Rowling? Yep. The author of Harry Potter. Um, she recently, last month, stood up for something that she really believes in, which is that there is male and female. We, we all believe in that, right? Yeah. Male and female. Because she said that there's only two gender, okay, um, she was called out online. People are saying, how can you not stand with us who are transgender? How can you not stand with us, you know, who are bisexual? How can there only be two genders in this world? Because according, okay, to their idea, there are 64 gender right now in this world. Not two, 64. Because gender is a spectrum. It's a spectrum. Whether you're male, female, where are you in the spectrum? Every year, the number is increasing. Now, can't you see that it's also lawlessness? See, God has ordained for there to be man and woman. Now, we're living in a society that tells us, hey, it's not only two, it's 64. And every year, we're increasing even more. People are trying to remove words that are too masculine, too feminine, 
In fact, now the word breastfeeding, people don't use anymore. It's chest feeding. Why? Because they want to be neutral, gender neutral. You see, I'm telling you all of this because we all as the church need to know how to engage and form our opinions on this based on what God says, not based on what I say. Amen? In Malaysia recently, we have a Miss Universe Malaysia. All right? She made some remarks that I really disagree with. Okay? She talked about what has happened in the US, you know, and because of that, she was called out online. Within 24 hours, there was a petition on change.org. Usually we use that against the government or something, but <laughs> people use this to say that, hey, this Miss Malaysia Universe organization should remove her of her crown, you know? And true enough, they came out with a statement that said that. The next day, she's a model, right? And she has a contract. She was sponsored by the makeup company. The makeup company said, you know what? We're cutting our ties with you. We don't want to be associated with you anymore. Within 24 hours, she lost everything. And this is the cancel culture. Why am I sharing these stories? It's to show the reality of this mystery of lawlessness that's already happening in the world right now. So as Christians, how do we respond to such lawlessness such as this thing called the cancel culture? There are many lawlessness we can talk about, but today, I just want to focus on one. You see, the cancel culture, okay, does not forgive you. The gospel forgives you. The cancer culture does not redeem you. It doesn't give you a chance for redemption. The gospel redeems you through the work of Jesus. The cancer culture cannot atone for your sins because your sins in the past, they'll bring it up and say, now you're wrong because of what you've done eight years ago. The gospel tells you that all your sin has been forgiven on the cross because of what Christ has done. The cancer culture will give you a standard of justice and as long as you're not with that standard, you are wrong. But the gospel tells you that the justice has been met by Christ on the cross. He is that standard of justice. So when we want to talk about all of this, the gospel doesn't cancel anyone out. That is the good news of the gospel. Because the narrative of the gospel is that we cancel God first. We rejected Him first as sinners. It all happened in the Garden of Eden. But God in His great mercy didn't cancel us. Instead, He gave us a solution which is His Son. That is the gospel. Think about this, Adam and Eve rejected God at the garden. What do you think would be a just punishment for them? What would be fair? I think God should have just killed them. Because why? God already said, don't touch this, but yet they still went and go ahead with it. But what did God do? God is so merciful. He just expelled them from the garden. What? That's it? Such an easy thing? But not only that, He clothed them and He made a way for them to be restored to Him again. All of us here, we deserve punishment. But God is so gracious, so merciful that He will not do that to us. God doesn't desire to cancel anyone. If you're here and you feel like there are so many standards of the world that you must live to, and if you don't live to that standard, you'll be cancelled by the society. The good news is this, God doesn't cancel you out. If you would come to Him as you are in your sinful state, in your needy state, in your dependent state, in your hopelessness, and come with repentance before Him, God will embrace you and welcome you into His presence and clothe you with righteousness. So that is the mystery of lawlessness that's already happening right now with this cancel culture. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Now, how do we respond to this? Because no point we just talk about culture and just feel sad. Paul thankfully showed us how to respond to lawlessness in the days to come. And that is from verse 13 to 17. Okay? So we're going to be looking into what is his encouragement for us, all right? And particularly to the church in Thessalonica back then. Let's read verse 13. All right? Paul said this, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved, through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this, he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold on to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. That is such a good news that Paul gave us. 
And how do we respond? Three things that we can learn from Paul today. Firstly is this, we are to be sanctified by the Spirit and believe in the truth. He says this in verse 13, no, we are true sanctification by the Spirit and believe in the truth. Now, what is truth? Remember, we talked about two gender and 64 gender. What is truth? I wonder what your truth is. Your truth is either two or 64. You know, it's important to know what is truth. Now, I want to help us to understand this because more and more, we will be challenged in the days to come. Yeah. Are we going to stand? Hey, God said there's two gender, but the world is telling us it's 64, so what do we believe in? Now, I want you to think about this. There are two types of truth. There's one thing that's called subjective truth. One more is called objective truth. Let's talk about subjective truth. Okay, I love to eat burgers. Who loves burgers here? Okay, a lot of you. What is your favourite burger place in Penang? Just shout it out. Spades. Okay, a resounding spades. Looks like it. What about those who are not spades? What are your favourite burger place? Ramli. Okay, my favourite is the one that me and my wife makes. That's the best. Okay, we won't tell you where we get our patty from, but it's the best. If you want, come and ask us personally. We've made for a few people in church before. It's the best burger. But you see, some people like spades, some people like Ramli, some people like my own burgers. <laughs> see, that is subjective truth. You have your own version of truth, and that is okay. Right, because I cannot say, no, my burger is the best. You must believe it's the best in Penang. <laughs> if not, then you're cancelled. You see, that's what cancel culture do to you. That is subjective truth. You can have your own opinions. It's okay. But what is objective truth? Objective truth is this. Burgers must have a, pet, a bread, a patty, and a bread. Is that correct? Do we all agree on that? Or someone else has a different idea? That is how burgers are made. You see, that's objective truth. I cannot come to you and tell you, oh, burger is made out of mashed potato, veg, and patty. It doesn't work that way. Because objective truth is that burger must have a bun, it must have patty, and it must have another bun at the bottom. Without that, it is not a burger. Yeah. Of course, the objective the truth that we're talking about is more than burgers. It's about the Word of God. <laughs> but I want to help us to understand because we are living in a world today that is post-truth. means truth is no longer celebrated, especially objective truth. You see, what for believers as us, what is objective truth for us? It's this thing. It's the Bible. This is our objective truth there'll be a lot of people out there with different ideas of truth. But your truth must be formed on this. This is your objective truth. Amen? Why is truth so important? Because, oh, sorry. Go back. Because in verse 10 to verse 12, in 2 Thessalonians 2, it says those who are perishing refuse to love the truth and be safe. God will send them a strong delusion that they may believe what is false in order that all who condemn did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. See, the Bible says, those who are perishing refuse to love the truth. The truth that the Bible is talking about is the gospel, the word of God. That is the truth. And the Bible and the gospel should be our objective truth. Think about this. Jesus was super controversial when he came 2,000 years ago and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Wow, everyone would be so offended. How can you say you are the way? How can you say you are the truth? There's no way because we have different ideas of truth. But right now, you are claiming that you are the way, the truth, and the life. See, that is super controversial. So it's either Jesus really believed he is the way, the truth, and the lie, life, or on the other hand, he is a complete lunatic. He's crazy. Now, what kind of version of Jesus do you believe in? Is he who he claims to be? The way, the truth, and the life? Or do you think he is completely insane to say that? People responded differently back then, and you know who they were. The Jewish people, you know, they crucified him on the cross because they think he was a lunatic. How could he say that? There's no way. But Jesus came with that message. So if for us as Christians, we really believe what Christ has said and who he claims to be, then he is the absolute truth. The way, the truth, and the life is Christ. Amen? That is absolute truth for us. And we can only build our life on this objective truth to form our subjective opinions of the things that we see around us. So what I'm saying here, think about this, we should interpret events of the world through the lens of the gospel instead of interpreting the gospel through the lens of the world. When you look at the events of the world, let this be before you. 
Let this be before you. You don't take what is happening in there, you come in here and try to interpret it. No, let this be before you. Let this be your absolute truth before you form your opinion of what you see in the world around you. Because the scary truth is this, more and more we all will be challenged in the days to come. It will not be just 2 or 64, it could be 2 to 98 in the years to come. It's not just on the idea of gender. So many things we will be challenged with. The good news is that at the end, Christ will come, he'll return, and he'll defeat this man of lawlessness. So the gospel should be primary and central to us. And that's what I want us to take home today, especially in the last days, because today it is no longer popular to be a Christian. Amen. I became a Christian when I was 17 years old. That was 13 years ago. Back then, when you tell, tell your friends you're a Christian, you go to church, like, oh, hey, your church got banner. Your church has drummer, right? You know, and people would think that going to church is so cool. Now, when you tell people you go to church, like, okay, you are too religious, you are irrelevant, you know, you are not progressive, you are too conservative. We are living in an age where it's no longer popular to be a Christian. Now, when you tell your friends you're a Christian, they're like, mm, okay, you are very judgmental. I wouldn't want to be friends with you. But how? How do we deal with that? We need to constantly ask, what does the Bible say about the situation that we see around us? How do we view things like abortion? How do we view things like same-sex marriage? How do we view things like gender identity? How do we view things like social injustice and racism? You see, all of these are forms and mysteries of lawlessness. How do we view cancer culture? It is only through the gospel. Remember that in the last days, it says that God will send a strong delusion. It means all of us will receive, if we don't stand with the truth, we will be deceived to think that we know what is true, but it's actually it's false. That's why today, this message is for us to prepare ourselves spiritually. We all need to know what is truth. We all need to really go deeper into the Word. Growing into intimacy with Christ. Let's not play church anymore. Let's not pray being a Christian anymore. Because I can tell you right now, it's not cool to be a Christian. If you come to church, people won't count you cool. People say you're too religious. So if you're here, let us come with the right heart and intent. Amen? Because it's going to be a greater test in the days to come when the man of lawlessness is revealed. It's going to be a greater test. It says here many will be deceived. You see, my dream and my hope is that all of us here will not be deceived. That all of us here, when we see God face to face, God will say, I knew you. Not, I never knew you, workers of lawlessness. He will say, I knew you, enter into my kingdom. Well done, good and faithful servant. That is what I desire for all of us to receive when we see God face to face. Yeah. See, recently in the Western world, um, churches has been divided. These are Christian churches, by the way. Okay? They've been divided about this whole thing called the Black Lives Matter. And I know that it's a very sensitive topic, but we have to address it. Okay? Maybe not so relevant in Malaysia, but I will show you what is the root cause of all of this. I shared an article about why Christians shouldn't support Black Lives Matter on Facebook a month ago and received a lot of uh, comments uh, from fellow Christians where we had healthy debates okay, on how do we deal with this matter. Okay? You see, my challenge to them was this. We are not called to be on the side of what is right, but what is true. So I challenge people, okay, what do you think the Bible says about this? Okay, a lot of them say, you know, we definitely must fight for all lives. Black lives, yellow lives, whatever colour you are, we must fight for all. Because why? We are all made in the image of God. Yeah. Our basis is Imago Dei. We are made in the image of God, regardless of our colours. We are all made in the image of God. In fact, the Bible says we are of one race, the race of Adam. So if you look beyond your skin colour, we are all really a race of Adam. When we go up to heaven, it will not be, oh, we are confused who is who. We know we are all people of God. We are all of one race. So a lot of people were supporting this movement and I was challenging them, okay, hey, but do you actually read their mission statement or not? What they believe in? They say, oh yeah, of course, they, they want to fight for equality, for injustice. I'm like, no, 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 you're going to read further. Here's what I want to tell you. As a Christian, if you support this movement, you are supporting the LGBTQ agenda because they are fighting for that. Okay, that is the first thing you will see on the website. Go to the website, check out the mission statement. Second thing is that you are fighting against God-ordained family units because they are going out there to destroy all the nuclear family units. It means they don't want to have father, mother, child. They want there to be villages. No longer father, mother, child. And what has happened to God-ordained family? 
There will be a man and a woman, they will bear a child. You see? That is truth for us. If you are supporting them, you are also going against the nation of Israel because their whole propaganda is to kill the Jewish people as well. If you study them and understand the umbrella of the organization that they are coming from, they are coming from a place where they are out to kill the Jewish people. So right now, when they are out in the street, they are no longer just fighting for black lives. They are asking for us to kill the Jewish people. And these Jewish people are important for us because in the last days, we are playing a big role before Christ returned to preach to the Jewish people. These are God's elected people. We are simply grafted into it. So you think about this. So many things that they are fighting for that maybe we don't know on surface level. But why am I telling you this? Because I need you all to go and study on your own. Before you see something online and you just read the headline, like, oh yeah, I'm going to support this. Always understand what is their truth. Remember, there's subjective truths everywhere. We need to know what is absolute truth. Objective truth is the word of God. They are also fighting for defunding the police. Means they don't want there to be any police. In certain states in the US, a lot of police have left their job because it's no longer safe. So what is that? Lawlessness. Now it's a lawless country. Things are happening and it always happens before the election. And this has also come into sports and politics. Right? If you watch football, okay, I'm a Manchester United fan. I know a few of us are here. Yeah. We've been playing a lot of games recently. Okay, we've been winning a lot. But the first few games of football, every player, it was super confusing, okay? Every player, uh, their jersey behind wasn't their name. So it wasn't Wilson, you know, it wasn't Greenwood, it was Black Lives Matter. It was so confusing because everyone on the pitch was Black Lives Matter, okay? Before they start the game, they will take a knee. They will go down the knee, all right, uh, to support this movement. You see, this movement has seeped into even sports. Politicians are also doing the same thing. I've seen politicians, when they give press conference, they will take a knee before they give the press conference. Now, how does the church respond to this? May God give us the wisdom, really, because more and more, we are going to be challenged with these truths. What is absolute truth? What is subjective truth? We cannot fall into what the media is telling us because there's always the media's narrative and the gospel's narrative. What does the gospel say about this? You see, the gospel is not anti-culture. It's not like everything also be anti-anti, anti-BLM, you know, anti-cancer culture. But the gospel is counter-culture because we always respond with a different message. We respond focusing more on we dealing with the sinful state of humanity because we know that all the problems that we see, rebellion, lawlessness, comes down to the issue of heart. It's the issue of us. We are all sinners. That's why all of this are coming up. So the gospel doesn't just deal with circular matters. The gospel deals with internal matter because it's eternal life that is at stake. And may the Holy Spirit continue to sanctify us just like what it says here, sanctify us by the Spirit and believe in the truth. The second thing that Paul said is this, we are to stand firm and hold on to the traditions. Verse 15, stand firm and hold on to the traditions. You see, Paul is encouraging the church back then to stand firm in their faith, not only in persecution because they were persecuted so badly, but you see the word traditions because they were also being fed a lot with false teachings. All right? So Paul is telling them, stand firm in your faith in the face of persecution, in the face of false teachings or ideologies that are coming here. Traditions for us are the doctrines that we believe in, you know, the Christian ordinances that we observe. So like I said, 10 years ago, it was cool to be a Christian. Now it's no longer cool, Okay? Now when you tell people you're Christian, they say you are too conservative, you're too traditional. And sometimes Christianity has progressed so much that when I look at it, I'm so afraid. What is going on with the world around us? We are super progressive. We no longer hold on to the traditions. Could it be that Paul is reminding us, hey, hold on to the traditions. Remember the gospel in all of this. You see, we can no longer settle at being cultural Christians. It means we are Christians because we like to be a Christian. Either we come to church, we love the environment here, we're here because someone brought us here. We love the culture here. You see, that is culture Christian. We need true Christians in these last days. Because right now, if you tell yourself you're a Christian, it's more costly for you. It's more costly to tell yourself, tell, tell others that you're a Christian as compared to an atheist. An atheist can go around and say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. And they're like, oh, that's good. If you go around, I'm a Christian. 
you're judgmental. You know, you guys are terrible people. So you can see that we're living in an age where we'll be more challenged with all of this in the days to come. And sometimes for all of us here, we are subscribed so much to the things that we see online, on social media, that sometimes it affects us without us interpreting it through the gospel. I want to acknowledge that it happened to me. All right? And sometimes I form my opinion based on what I see online. But now I've learned to be more discerning, to know how to understand it according to God's narrative. And may God give us the grace to do that as well. You see, this is the problem of the world. It is sin. Do we all agree on that? It's sin. All of us are sinners. I mentioned it. The problem that we see today in the world is the result of sin. But what are we giving them now? This is the solution that we're giving them. We're offering them more reforms or revolutions, right? Whether it's about gender, whether it's about race, whatever you can think of that is happening around the world. We know that the problem is sin, but the solution we're giving them is this. As Christians, what is the real solution? It is the gospel. The gospel is the only solution. Because think about this, until the sin problem is dealt with, and 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, until we become new creations in Christ, the problems of injustice in this world will continue to be there. It will never end. Because why? We are only trying to fix it with this. Instead of fixing it with the gospel. The gospel transforms the lives of people. We are all seated here today and can testify to that because the gospel changed our life. All of us have once been in a place, maybe we have hatred towards someone but God has restored us, now we can love someone. You see, that's why the message of the gospel is so unique. We respond in that manner, and it's very different from what the world is telling us. We should cancel people out. So the real solution isn't just more reforms. The real solution is the gospel. Amen? I always ask people this question when I want to have a deeper conversation with them. I'll ask, why are you a Christian? So I'll say, I'm a Christian because 13 years ago, this is my own story. Uh. I was without purpose, right? I went to church and I found purpose um, and yeah, I decided to become Christian. Some people will say, I became a Christian because um, I was having a sickness and God healed me from a sickness. Some people will say, well, I became a Christian because I needed a breakthrough financially and God provided when I prayed and I became a Christian. You see, all those things are good and I'm not, I'm not discounting your testimony or my testimony. But the main reason why we are Christians is this. We are Christians because we recognize we are sinners. We recognize that we need God in our life because if we go to heaven one day without God, without Jesus, we are going to be sent to hell. Eternal damnation for us. So why are you a Christian? We are Christian because we acknowledge that we are sinners and we need Christ in our life. And similarly for the world, we need to point them to the gospel. The gospel is primary, essential, because the gospel, which is Jesus Christ, is the only answer. If you want to do any good for the world right now, let's take a look into the example of Jesus and Paul. Think about this. Jesus and Paul, okay, lived in a time where they were under Roman Empire. There would have been a lot of injustice around them. What did they do? Did they go around joining the march? They simply preached the gospel. Because Jesus knew that his ultimate mission wasn't to come to change governments. He was brought before the court and what he did remained silent. That's why all the disciples, the early apostles, were willing to go to prison to die for the sake of the gospel because they knew their main mission on earth was to preach the gospel, which is Christ and him crucified. Now, today, if we think about this, do we still do that? Are we willing to stand on that absolute truth or do we conform ourselves to the patterns of the world. Jesus came to solve a spiritual problem, more than just a circular issue that we see around us. And that is what we need to change the hearts and the minds of people. Amen? I think one thing that we need to take note of is this, that the revival we need in this generation is not social reformation and revolution. It's a revival of repentance. That more and more will come to repentance before Christ, including ourselves. Repentance doesn't just happen one time. It's a continuous thing. It's a continuous pattern of life that we live. Repentance before Christ, coming to Him knowing that in our own human nature, we are sinful, but we need Christ in our life. The third thing, and the last thing that Paul said, but this is in verse 16 and 17. 
all right? Establish ourselves in every good work and word. We talked about lawlessness earlier today. Remember that word, lawlessness? Okay. What is the opposite of lawlessness? What do you think? Law, yes. Law is the opposite of lawlessness. Good answer. Another word is called righteousness. Amen. Righteousness is the opposite word of lawlessness as well. Romans says this, for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now pre present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Romans said this, in Hebrews 1, chapter, uh, Hebrews 1, 9, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God has anointed you with the oil of gladness be beyond your companions. You see, when you're living in a state of righteousness, your heart will grieve for lawlessness. All right? And those who have the nature of Jesus, he's righteous, right? And he hid what's lawless. But he knew that the thing that he has to do is not only change the things that are happening in the world, it is changing the human condition in the hearts, right? You see, that's why it says here, good work and good words. Remember, good work and good word. It's important that we don't only show good work, it's also the good word as well. The testimony, the gospel has to be present when we try to change the things around us. Now, Paul was praying for them here that God will help them to live in a way that will demonstrate their faith through their word and through the work of their hands. And in today's cancer culture, all right, many people will be the first to cast a stone once you make a mistake. How do we respond? We respond with grace, we respond with love. We embrace people, telling them there's hope for you. See, that is the good word of the gospel as well. Those who disagree with you will cancel you, tell you that you're not worthy. You will lose your job because of it. But what does the gospel do? The gospel will tell you that you are worthy. Christ died for you. He deemed you worthy. So the cancel culture will not give you a redeemed identity, but Jesus can. Amen? Jesus can give you a redeemed identity. And as Christians, we're instructed to act and speak in a way that demonstrates the reality of our faith. The more we are embracing and seeing the things around us, the more we engage with the online world, let us be slow to speak, quick to listen. Because the reality is that sometimes we can be very quick to speak and slow to listen. We, we try to engage everything. But maybe we need to take a step back and say, what is God saying about this? How can I respond to this person whom I disagree with? With love, with grace, with humility? We all need to learn how to allow God's word as the absolute truth to form our subjective opinions of the things that we see around us. Because remember, we are living in the age of lawlessness. We are living in an age where there are so many cultural wars that are already happening. And more and more, we will be challenged with this. Today's message is not an easy message to preach because it is one that will help us understand that we need God more than ever in this generation. Yeah. And I pray that every one of us will begin to take this gospel seriously, begin to allow the words to transform us. As we come to a close, three things that we talk about today, we are to be sanctified, believe in the truth. Remember, we talk about objective truth and subjective truth. We are to stand firm in the teachings of Jesus the doctrines, the traditions, and we have to establish our hearts in every good work and word. In all that we do, may we live in a life that would glorify Christ. See, Paul's teaching in this chapter was actually a warning. Yes, he gave some encouragement, but it was a warning for them because the warning is that, hey, the end is actually not as near as you thought it could be because they were scared. They thought, oh, end, Jesus is really bad. But he's telling them, you know what? The end is not here yet, but it will come before that happens, you need to stand firm in the midst of lawlessness. And today for us, let us not be too concerned about seeing COVID-19, seeing injustice as, oh, is Jesus coming back already? The thing is that, are we ready spiritually for the return of Jesus? That should be our question, you know? And as we continue to navigate through this age of lawlessness, may we continue to stand firm in Christ. You see, our lawless resulted in Christ's death. All of us. But God's grace overcome our lawless hearts. Christ died on the cross, offered us grace, and that overcome our lawless hearts. And the truth is that many will grow cold in the days to come. The Bible says, 
Many will be deceived, many will abandon the faith, which is why we all need to really know Jesus, not just as cultural Christians, not just as coming to church and that is all we know about Jesus, but we need to really know Him personally on a deeper level. I will end with this kind of article, not a quote, a quote poem by J.C. Rao, said this, Today is the cross, tomorrow is the crown. Today is the labour, but tomorrow is the wages. Today is the sowing, but tomorrow is the harvest. Today is the battle, but tomorrow is the rest. Today is the weeping, but tomorrow is the joy. And what is today compared to tomorrow? Today is but 70 years, but tomorrow is eternity. Be patient and hope until the end. As we look at the world around us today, I don't know about you, but sometimes I grieve so much on what's happening. And maybe it hasn't really challenged us yet, but I can assure you this, that it will come a day when we will be challenged in our faith. Do we still believe in this Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life, or do we discount him and think that he's crazy? May we all stand firm in Christ. Today, while we're fighting this, let us not forget there's tomorrow. That is the great hope. We are not fighting a losing battle. It says when Christ returns, he will defeat Satan. And today, as we continue to navigate through all of this, may we remind that tomorrow is eternity. 70 years on this earth is nothing as compared to eternity with Christ. May we live for eternity and more than the 70 years that we have here. Amen. I'm going to invite all of us to stand. As the worship team leads us in a time of ministry, I want to speak to two groups of people here today as we come to a time of ministry. Firstly, it's for us as Christians. Whether you're watching this physically or online, think about this question. Am I ready spiritually for the return of Jesus? Could it be that I've been influenced by the things I see around me that I don't even see what does the Word of God say about this? Today we learn about being sanctified in the truth, standing firm in Him, establishing our hearts in every good work and word. And maybe it's time for us to come before Him as God's people to recommit our lives before Him again. Maybe we've been away from church for some time and now we're back in church and we think, oh, all's going to be good. But you hear a message like that that challenges you. But I think we all need it. I need this. I need this. We all need to stand firm in the faith. Second group is, if you are not a believer and you're here listening to this message, whether it's here or online, you've been seeing this culture that's happening around you, they're telling you you're not worthy, you'll be cancelled. Remember the good news of the gospel I told you about? Jesus does not cancel you. You will never be able to live up to the standards of the world, including us as Christians. Christ is our standard. He is the only one that we can look to. No matter how hard we try, our best will never be enough for the world out there. Even for God. Because the best was given by God. God gave the solution. Christ Himself. And because of that, we all can receive the righteousness of Christ. All we need to do is respond in repentance, coming before Him and saying, God, I need you. I put aside my good efforts. I put aside my abilities. I come and trust in your righteousness. I come in repentance. Would you forgive me? So whichever group you are in this morning, in this time of ministry, let us offer our lives to God again. Amen. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. We are here Set our hearts on you.
Sometimes it may seem so discouraging. But Lord, we are reminded today that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And I pray for every one of us as believers right here in this place. Lord, would you help us to stand firm in the truth of God? Lord, even as we see and interpret what's happening around the world, Lord, may we primarily put the gospel before anything. May we see Jesus before anything, oh God, Lord. I pray a lot, God, that you will give us the grace to be able to persevere through this season, oh Father, in the days to come. Lord, we know that the best is yet to come, but it only comes at the end of the day when you return and establish your kingdom. But in the present reality, as we continue to stay in this world, Lord, we will be challenged in our faith. And I ask that you grant us the grace to stand firm in you, to be able to trust in you, oh Father, and to know who we believe in. Lord, help us to not be cultural Christians anymore. Help us not play the church game or the Christian game anymore. But Lord, we want to come to you in repentance. We want to come to you and say that, Lord, we really want you. We know that we are sinners. That's why we need you a lot, God. We're not here to just be part of a culture. We're here to be part of a relationship with you a lot, God. We want to be in your kingdom. So Lord, we commit ourselves into your hands. I pray for those who do not know you as well. As they are listening to this message of Father Lord, God. Lord, that would you... Help them to see that their worth and identity is found in you. Despite what the culture might say about us, it might cancel us out, it might seem uh, deem us as unworthy, but we thank you that the gospel says that we are worthy. Christ has really demonstrated that through the cross. So I pray that you bring encouragement even to those who are listening to this.